All right, welcome everyone. Welcome to day three of The Road to Mastery. I'm your host, David Lee Kim, co-founder of Omniscient Digital. We've been having a bunch of really smart people here in content, SEO, conversion optimization, teaching us about how to convert with content. We have another very intelligent, pretty man coming up here to tell us about A-B testing. Um, before we get uh, to Brian, I will give a quick rundown of today. So while I do that, please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, share your name, where you're based. And today our icebreaker is, what's your go-to karaoke song? Um, so for me, uh, I'm based out of Boston. I think my go-to karaoke song is, What's My Age Again by Blink-182. Um, I just saw <laughs> that they're going to be back on tour with a new album tomorrow. So if anyone's into that, recommend looking at that. Brian, what's your your go-to karaoke song? You look like you, uh, you'd enjoy some good karaoke. Uh, you know, I usually start off with all my exes live in Texas, a little <laughs> George Strait, a nice low um, register, so I can actually hit all the notes or most Amazing. some of them. <laughs> yeah, looks like Carissa's a uh, big Spice Girls fan. Uh, Jen is into Fever by Peggy Lee. I haven't heard that one. Um, I got but... a fever. Yeah, that's <laughs> Oh, is that it? I'm horrible with song names. Um, all right, so today, uh, here we have Brian, our first session with Brian, who's gonna be talking about how to get started with A-B testing. Following, immediately following Brian, we're gonna have a comedian, John Huck, doing some stand-up, maybe some sit-down comedy. So take a break from work and join us for that. And then to close out the day, we'll have Joanna Wee, who's gonna teach us about turning voice of customer into copy. Some quick housekeeping before we get started with Brian. We will be sending a recording of his session and uh, Joanna's session as well, and we'll be sharing the slides. We'll also be doing a Q&A at the end of Brian's talk, so feel free to drop any and all questions in the chat, and we'll make sure to get to them at the end. So, I'll, Brian, you need no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway to let folks know how just how great you are. Brian is the founder of Conversion Sciences and author of the book, Your Customer's Creation Equation. His rare combination of interests and experience was developed over 30 years as a computer programmer, entrepreneur, corporate marketer, international speaker, and writer. He's a man, man of many backgrounds here. He is a sought after speaker who's presented at IBM, Inbound, Leeds Con, Content Marketing World, Affiliate Summit, and others. So you're in for a treat. Brian, take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction. Yeah, you people are the strange ones that are in a talk about getting started with A-B testing. It says a few things about you. Interest in truth, interest in, in um, collecting the best day that you can and understanding the answers that you're, well, the answers about who your visitors are and why they behave the way they are. Um, I am going to, uh, proceed through this. And by the time we're done, not only give you the basics on A-B testing, but giving you a good place to start. Um, I've been doing this since 2007. Uh, I've made all of the mistakes that you're going to get to make as you slide into A-B testing. But I will say that it is pretty awesome. It's uh, uh, to an extent kind of gamifying your marketing. You get a little bit of a horse race, you get to see your ideas running against the control. Um, so I love this part of the business. It's not the only way to collect data, but it certainly is the best data, the most authoritative data you can collect. And the good news is that you guys are already A-B testing. You're already making decisions about um, what kind of stuff you're posting on your Instagram based on the number of likes uh, and um, shares that you get on what you're already posting. If you have a post that gets a lot of likes and shares, you're going to do more of that. You are already using this when you're trying to decide what movie to see or if you should see a movie. Um, the Rotten Tomatoes score, the freshness score gives you an idea of what other people thought. So using other people's behaviors to make decisions in your own life. The New York Times bestseller list, same sort of thing. So we're already pretty good at this. We've uh, over the years, been able to issue lab coats to partners and customers and employees who have demonstrated their natural ability to be science scientists. And this is 
the steady state going forward for digital marketing. If you're not able to consider um, data in the decisions that you're making, your design decisions, your copy decisions, uh, then you are uh, at a loss, you're at a disadvantage to your competitors. So um, the reason that we're naturally wired to this is that we're used to predicting our outcomes based on the outcomes of others. Now, we call this statistics, but in our minds, we're not really using that. Let me, let me give you an example. So here is a ratings review for a product, and I think this is from Amazon. So we're looking at the sample mean. We don't call it that. It's the average number of stars. We're also looking at the sample size. So this particular product had 116 ratings. We know that if we've got a five-star product, but it only has five reviews, well, it's probably not uh, necessarily a five-star product. Um, and we're also looking at the distribution of five star, four star, three star, one star products. In fact, if we flip this around, we can see that that this is a sample distribution. So for this one, 71 percent of the visitors are five stars, 23 percent are four stars. And in our minds, we're going to calculate the confidence interval. What are the odds that our experience with this product will be five stars or four stars? If there were a lot more three star, two star, one star, we would expand our confidence interval and assume that our experience of the product may fall further down range. The problem is that we make mistakes. So between our ears are three pounds of seething biases. And what this means is marketers is when we're making decisions about what we design, landing pages we design, web pages that we design, um, that we are going to take shortcuts. We are going to prefer things that we're comfortable with, uh, that we're familiar with. Uh, we're going to make choices that, um, with our design and copy that is based on what has worked for us before, even though it might be a different audience, a different campaign. We will avoid things that have bit us in the butt in the past. Um, and all of these shortcuts work against us. We've also got these uh, un- um, unknown biases, um, uh, stereotypes get in the way. So if we think we're writing for a, for instance, a familiar, uh, a, fam a female audience, we might make the mistake of choosing pastels and pinks because, well, it's one of the stereotypes that our culture has reinforced. So we want to get these stereotypes out of the way. And this is what science is about. This is what A-B testing and the lab coats and everything is about. So the poor decisions we make can be very simple. Here is a clear correlation of the sales of ice cream versus forest fire. So it's pretty clear from this graph that ice cream causes forest fires or maybe forest fires cause ice cream. It's not really clear. This next one's more, I like more though. So uh, this is a, a a graph of the amount of ice cream that is sold versus the average weight per capita of uh, an audience. And so clearly eating more ice cream is going to make you lose weight. Um, well, what we know is that there is a, another confounding element and it's called summer. Ice cream gets, good, the sales of ice cream go up during the summer and during the summer when we're supposed to look good in bathing suits, we tend to be a little bit more diligent with our weight. So we want to use A-B testing to take correlation and add causation. And that's really what we're trying to do. Um, this means that you are going to have to put on the mantra of an experimenter. Now, experimentation is not just A-B testing. We use all sorts of data for experimentation. When you're in analytics and looking at the results of pages that you've launched, you're experimenting. You're looking at the data after an action to see how things have changed. Um, but it's a very important role. The days of launch and see where you have a really smart, creative team design a whole web page and shove it out. I hope they're coming to an end. Unfortunately, still these days, most designs are done that way. And it's just crazy, especially if you've got an existing site that you can be running experiments on and you have sources of data from the audience coming to that site, 
that will inform your decisions, your copy, the images you choose, the journeys, the user experience, all of that. Very few questions to these days can not be answered with some data that supports or refutes those design decisions. We get calls all the time. Hey, we launched a new page and the leads went down. We launched an entire new site and the leads went down. And the reasons for these are manifold. Uh, the new page was not as good as the old page. That is what our assumption often is. But there's also issues around seasonality. We just happened to launch the new page at the same time that the market changed. We launched it at the beginning of the summer and uh, or at the end of the summer and we sell swimsuits and the market is just not going to be there for swimsuits in October or November. Um, changes in the ad spend. So it's not uncommon for us to have a different team doing our ad spend. Uh, uh, our ad management, and maybe they change something coincidentally at the same time that we launched that page. And something we can't control or predict at all is what our competitors are doing. Did they turn up their ad spend and start bidding more on key high value phrases so that we're getting less of that? And so we're getting less valuable traffic, which is converting lower. It certainly will look like the new page is the culprit, but we don't know. You can end a promotion about that time, and there could just be a technical error that's causing the problem. So um, we have to um, use some statistical rigor in order to um, really handle, uh, to really understand what is causing changes in performance. Um, we want to remove our biases from our brain and we want to control for these unknowns. And you probably have all seen something like this where we've designed this beautiful cement path through this lovely glade of trees. Runners, walkers, bikers should be just delighted to be on our path that we created for them. Uh, but the grass is telling us a different story. So our biases between our ears is going to say, oh, well, clearly we want, we need to make things shorter. So we need to make all of our paths straight lines between point A and point B. But is that really what's going on here? Or is it that runners prefer to run on grass because it's easier on their knees? Is it because this path is shadier and so they're trying to stay out of the sun during our hot summer months? We really want to understand the why behind this and not let our biases draw conclusions. So what I want to do is give you a tool that you can go and use right now. It doesn't require that you install any A-B testing software, that you understand how to design uh, an A-B test, although by the time I'm done here, you will understand what the key issues are. Uh, and it is before and after testing. So with before and after testing, you're going to find a point in time in which you launched a change to a page. And we're going to apply the rules of A-B testing, a little bit of rigor, to handle some of the things that were unpredictable, those unknowns that I went through. The testing tool is analytics. So again, you don't have to install uh, Google Optimize or Optimizely or VWO or Convert.com, you get to do all of this analysis in your analytics tool, Google Analytics, Adobe Analytics, et cetera. Anything that will tell you uh, how much traffic came to the changed page and how many conversions happened uh, with that traffic. The rules that we need to follow are the rules of A-B testing. So we're going to try to set this before and after test up as an a b test with the before period being the control the original page and the variant being the after the period after the new page was launched so that the new page is the variant and the first thing we want to do is make sure that the sample sizes are similar and i think my uh yes so Oftentimes, we're eager to find out the results of a change, and so we don't have as much time on the front end when we are, I'm sorry, on the back end after we've launched a test. We have a long history with the control. 
Well, even though there's a lot of data there, A-B testing rules, the statistical rules tell us that we want to have similar sample sizes. So uh, don't do this. Instead, choose it. We're going to choose a time frame that is similar in size. Um, and typically, this means uh, similar in the length uh, to the, the period of time after the, after the site, uh, the new page was launched. The other thing we're going to want to do is go and look at our traffic mix report uh, in Google Analytics. You'll find that in the acquisition tab and it will tell you over time how traffic is changing. Here you can see that uh, the email traffic changed about the same time that we launched this page. So what this means is the email team got a little aggressive and started sending more emails um, or got better at it and began bringing more email traffic to the site. In any case, this means that we can't really do a good comparison of the before versus the after time. Uh, so we, in our analysis, may want to create a segment that completely eliminates the email traffic and only look at our paid search traffic and organic traffic is usually one of those channels that um, uh, stays steady state over time. So go and make sure that there haven't been any surprises in your traffic mix. The other thing we want to be aware of is that we have intra-week seasonality. I'm sorry, intra-week seasonality. Our conversion rates are very different on the weekends than they are during the week. For most of us, conversion rates will go down on the weekends, but that's not true of everyone. So we want to have the same number of weekdays and weekends in the uh, the space we've chosen. So this is uh, from Google Analytics and a uh, simple comparison uh, of dates. And our after period has four weekend days while our pre our pre period, even though they're the same length, uh, has five weekend days. So we want to make sure that we are um, aligning these. And in fact, um, the rule of thumb is choose a number of days for your pre and post periods that is divisible by seven. So you want to check 14 days, 28 days, 35 days, 42 days, uh, set those, set the period of the, the data that you're going to be looking at to one of those. And that will pretty much guarantee that you have the same number of weekend and weekday days. It may also be important to start both periods on the same day of the week so that you are truly comparing apples to oranges. Some of you may have intra-month uh, seasonality where things people behave differently towards the end of the month than they do at the beginning of the month. You may want to uh, choose the before and after period or the, the, after, the before period to match the same time of the month um, that you are uh, comparing the after launch period. We want to look at rates, not actual conversions. Um, the easiest thing for us to do would be to go in and look at our new page and see how many conversions it's generating and compare that to the number of uh, um, conversions that were being generated by the old page. But traffic changes, as you know, we can't tell, even if your traffic looks the same, we can't tell what your competitors are doing to change the quality. So look at the conversion rate. And in this example, there was a, a drop in conversions about the time that we launched the new page, but the conversion rate remained relatively flat. So this is not an indictment of this page, even though there are fewer conversions, there was probably something changing in the, um, in the traffic. Now there are a lot of unknowns that we just can't control for, promotions, competitors, seasonality, unexpected seasonality. So we're going to be using a 97 or higher percent confidence. And as you might know, statistically, where uh, when we run an A-B test, we're looking for a confidence range, a, a, a confidence level that is at least 95 percent confident. What that tells us is that there's a only about a 5 percent chance that what we're seeing in this test is a result of random occurrences. However, when you have unknowns involved in your test, we want to make that even tighter. And it may not sound like a lot, but the difference statistically between 95% and 97% is significant. And I won't go into the standard deviations and the reasons for that, but even though it only sounds like there's a 2% uh, 
difference. Statistically, this is a much higher bar than 95%. And I'm just going to ask you to trust me on that. If you really want to make sure that your analysis is tight, you could look at 99%. That would be a very high bar indeed. We want to focus on goals that are meaningful, that, that are bottom line at the end. So if we are comparing a before and an after period, this control to the variant, uh, and we're looking at things like bounce rate, um, pages per visit, time on site, um, what we generally call engagement metrics, um, what, we're potentially making the wrong call. Um, there is not a correlation in all cases. In fact, it's about half and half of people spending more time on your page or more time on your site and an increase in conversion rate. Um, very, only half the time does that indicate there's a higher engagement rate indicate that you're going to be selling more. Sometimes a higher engagement rate means that you're more, they're more, they're more confused and they're, trying to figure out what the answers to their burning questions are, but your redesign has removed that. So be looking at form completion rates, look at um, transaction conversion rates. Uh, and for e-commerce, revenue per visitor is a kind of, it's a combination of both the conversion rate, the transaction conversion rate, and the average order value. Um, you can really increase transactions, but significantly reduce your average order value. And the Ultimately, uh, it's a wash or even a, a, a lower outcome because you're making less money based on the lower average order value. And then the other thing, and this is the hard one, this is the rub, always be willing to go back to the original. Now, as you guys, uh, I'm hoping after this, you're going to go and jump into analytics after you see John, by the way, he's hilarious, um, jumping into analytics and comparing past pages, you may no longer have the ability to go back if you're suddenly like, oh my gosh, the new page really is underperforming the original. But take that learning and understand that, you know, look at the difference in those pages to understand um, what you don't want to do in the future with your designs. In other words, you want to take, you don't want to use that page, that underperforming variant as a model for future landing pages or designing the entire site to look like that page because you have some pretty good data that it is not performing. Um, here's a, just a quick example. Uh, this is a change to our homepage. So I, of course, preferred to the control, which has a picture of me talking on stage. But we felt like um, we were maybe going too, all, too in on the lab coat, which, by the way, is proven to be a good branding hook for, um, for our business. But we wanted to really focus on... Um, more outward looking. So we redesigned our homepage. On January 25th of this year, we launched the new homepage. And so the question is, how did us, geniuses of conversion, how did we do on our launch? We do not have enough uh, conversions to run an A-B test. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, limitation. Um, so we really didn't have much of a choice other than a before and after analysis um, with some larger times. So the first thing I did was picked a time frame right after the launch of that page as the variant period and a similar period of time right before it. The first thing I noticed when I selected these dates, this is Google Analytics, was that there was an offset. So you can see that there is the sample size. Uh, you can see that there's an offset uh, for the weekend and weekend days. So let's go ahead and align those. I pushed the before period back a little bit to start on the 22nd of December. Uh, you can see that these align, but January 22nd is, uh, well, Christmas is in this mix. So we know traffic is going to behave differently. And so we're not comparing apples and apples to apples. And we really should do something about that. Um, so I actually went and chose a time before the holidays, all the way back to October 6th. I've got similar sample sizes. So you can see that the blue line, which is the number of uh, visitors, the number of users to the, um, the new page versus the, the orange line, which is the number of visitors to the old page are about the same. So I would anticipate similar sample sizes 
on this. They were they were very close. Um, when I looked at one of our goals, which is form submits, and this includes any of the lead magnets, people who are signing up for our free CRO course on the website, uh, people who are just signing up because they want to be notified uh, on our mailing list um, and be notified of new blog posts, there was no change. So our change in the homepage was essentially flat. It says negative 1.82%, but that's such a small change that statistically it is flat. And the conversion rate dropped just over 7%. Again, um, not, not significant, even though the arrow is red and down. And this is a mistake we want to make sure when we're interpreting data that the average um, change is not what's really happening in real life until we do the statistical analysis, which I will show you. Uh, however, when we looked at people who were signing up for free consultations on our website, bingo. So we're looking at a significant increase in consultations, uh, 77% and a 64%. We really do want to look at the conversion rate, 64%, over 64% increase in the conversion rate. And so I took the numbers. So you take um, the number of users for each of these periods, which is in this column. And you divide it by the number of goals in each that were completed. And you can use A-B testing tools to accomplish that. Uh, this is the testing uh, tool. I, my label is gone, but this is from CXL.com. And I think it's one of my favorites. But you can see that there's a 99% chance based on this before and after period that um, the uh, new homepage is doing a fantastic job on consultations, but it didn't change. It didn't affect people signing up for our uh, newsletter. So when we want to control for unknowns, it is completely possible for us to do that. Hopefully you guys will go home and do some of this before and after analysis, but let's talk about what if you could have both pages live at the same time. This removes all of these questions we have about what competitors are doing, how the traffic is changing, how seasonality is affecting things, and allows us to have both up at the same time. And voila, A-B testing tools. These are really powerful tools. I'm going to talk about some of the advantages you get from this other than just running A-B tests. But what I want to make sure is that everyone is aware of how these tools work. So I'm going to take us through very quickly the, the basics of A-B testing tools. So you've got a web server and it's serving pages. Boom. Not a problem. That's exactly what web servers are supposed to do. However, when you install an A-B testing tool, which usually is just adding a little bit of uh, JavaScript with a tag to the site, uh, it, allows, uh, it allows the tool to intercept that page in the visitor's browser. So this is all in the visitor's browser. And once the page is loaded in the visitor browser, it can make some changes. So for instance, this simple test might just change the image from the blue image to the yellow image. So the server is none the wiser. It still thinks it's serving the old page, but the visitor is seeing something completely different. This is how personalization works typically. Um, and this is the most common client side um, A-B testing. So, for instance, here's a page that we wanted to optimize. Our hypothesis was that people weren't reading the copy, so we want to really use a design to emphasize that copy. Well, the server kept serving this page. Uh, it was our testing tool that went in and changed the CSS and moved the copy around to deliver this page. The implication here is that you are able to really control the website beyond IT. So what can be modified in these tools? Uh, you can change the text on the page. You can change the HTML, the structure of the page, move things around on the page. You can change the CSS of the page, which changes fonts and colors and um, uh, images. Anything really that can be manipulated in JavaScript can be changed in the visitor's browser, which is technically almost everything. The only place where you run into trouble is when you, you need to get data from the server or communicate back to the server. 
The next thing that an A-B testing tool does is it figures out who gets entered into tests and tracks those people so that when they come back, they see that page again. So it's typically done with uh, cookieing. Um, the web server still thinks it's serving the original one, but the A-B testing tool says, oh, this person gets to see this one. And what we're doing is we wanna, since we've just learned that we want equal sizes, we can tell the testing tool to show the first visitor what the server showed. The second visitor gets the one with the, uh, the yellow image. The third visitor gets the green image and then all the way through. So this ensures that there's an equal number of people seeing each of the variations and statistically we're good. Now, who can we target? So we can target specific pages. So I want everyone coming to this landing page to be involved in the test. Half of them will see the control, the original, the one that's the server serving. Half of them will see the changes that I'm making. You can target based on whether they're on mobile or desktop. And we find ourselves testing more and more of these two audiences separately. You can test which channels they're coming from. So you can only test on paid search traffic. You can test only on uh, traffic coming from social media or organic search. You can target based on browser and OS. One of the things we're finding is um, that we might need to test Android and iPhone audiences differently because in certain situations, they behave very differently. Um, we have variations in A-B tests where the Android people loved the variation and the iPhone people hated it. What do you do? Well, technically, these are opportunities for personalization. You can target where they're coming from. You can target people based on interactions that they do. If they click on something, they get entered in the test and then half of them will see the control and half of them will see the variant or 30, 30, 30 if you have more than one variant. Uh, any segment you can design in uh, analytics, pretty much you'll be able to target with these testing tools. So the A-B testing tool gets the page from the server, the server is none the wiser, and it decides who gets to see the control, who gets to see the variation. And it's trying to make sure that the same number of people see each so that the statistics work out. So there are a couple of things that we can do with this. Now, um, there is, yes, we want to improve our conversion rate. So we're gonna test designs to see which one converts the best. But sometimes we're doing a rebrand or replatform and we're, just going to have to change uh, these pages or the entire website. Well, we can test those design changes on the existing website to see if they're going to hurt or help. We call this design insurance. You'd be perfectly happy if a redesigned page tested on the existing site before you've made any changes on the back end, implemented in the testing tool is actually going to, you know, have the same conversion rate at least as the original statistically. Um, invest, bef uh, test before you invest. So, um, if you do find that the new design is not performing well, well, then you've collected some data and can start to go back to the drawing board and figure out what's going on. In the meantime, you can roll back because remember the server still thinks it's serving the same page. So when you turn off the test, the website reverts back to the original page. Now, if you have a winner, you can actually set the testing tool to show 100% of the audience that winning variation. And so everyone is seeing the higher converting page and you're already harvesting, even before you've done the launch, harvesting on your old site from a superior page, higher conversion rates, more leads, more sales, all of the things that we love as marketers. You can do all of this testing before you ask IT to change anything. And if you're trying to do something ambitious, uh, this is a great way to uh, decide if it's going to work. Uh, if you're, uh, if you want to see how um, uh, live chat is going to, to to work, how many people are going to be interested in your live chat, you can design a test to see if you can draw people to live chat. And if you can't, then maybe you shouldn't invest the time and the money in implementing it on the site. And then finally, personalize. So if you do find that Android visitors love an experience, that iPhone visitors don't like an experience, you can use the testing tool to target those visitors with the different experiences. It becomes a little bit difficult to manage and, and such. So it's part of marketing is understanding uh, what we're offering to people and um, understanding our different segments. You can kind of see how these different segments become different personas. So what you're learning here can really help feed those different personas.
And then of course, the tools are doing the reporting, telling you when you've reached statistical significance, et cetera. And I'll show you some examples of that. Now, ultimately, A-B testing is about ideas. So the most important thing, all this technical statistics stuff aside is, are you testing the right things? So what I recommend is that all of you um, have a list of ideas um, that you're filling out. Um, this becomes your hypothesis list. That's what we call it to make ourselves sound really smart. Um, and then go about the business of getting things off of that list. Your job is to come up with a great ideas and then prove them wrong. So we're interested in how, how we kill ideas that are on those um, that are on that list. So good reasons to kill good ideas, because on your hypothesis list, on paper, they're all going to look like good ideas. The first reason is too few people are seeing it. So if you've got an idea for how to really improve your about page, is that really driving enough conversions that you could actually do an A-B test? Uh, the thing is that in A-B tests, while we are interested in equal sample sizes, which is how much traffic is seeing each experience, it's ultimately the number of conversions that is going to limit our ability to statistically evaluate that. So not only should it, the, the, the uh, idea be on a page that's getting a lot of traffic, it should also be on a page that is through which uh, a lot of conversions are being driven. So um, product pages, most conversions go through the product page. About page, fact pages, not so much. So those are not as good a candidates. Ideas on those pages are not as good a candidates. Uh, there is an A-B test calculator that you can use. So you can go into analytics and you can look at one page and you can find out uh, how many people are coming to that page. You cut that in half, assuming the tool is going to cut it in half. Or if you've got two ideas, you cut it in thirds, but you want it in equal parts. Uh, this is the link to that uh, conversion Excel test calculator. If you go to conversion.services slash calc and select the pre-test analysis, you can go in and say, all right, I've got um, so much traffic per week. Here's how many conversions are coming through that page. And I would make sure that um, unless you're making a change that is site-wide that you focus on conversions coming through that page, analytics will help you design that. And uh, how many variants you want to test, and it includes the control. So if you have one good idea that you're testing, the answer here would be two. And it is going to figure, fill out, um, give you the information that you need to see if you should do an A-B test. Um, so you get the number of conversions from analytics, the number of the weekly traffic from analytics, and the default here is typically 95%. If we're using this tool for a, a before and after test, we'll want to change this confidence level to 97%. But what we'll see is what's the minimum detectable effect. So how long would this test have to run or an idea on this page have to run in order for us to detect a reasonable amount of change? So most A-B tests, you know, our bread and butter is on tests that convert between uh, 10 and 15 percent. So if it's going to take six weeks for us to detect that this page is 14 percent better, then um, we have to be pretty confident that the, the change is going to be able to drive a 14 percent increase. Um, uh, so this is a great way to understand what if you've got enough traffic on a particular page for that idea. If not, we kill the idea and remove it from the hypothesis list. Reason number two to kill good ideas is that it's too much work. Uh, so there's uh, really four ways to run A-B tests. You can change the page. So you can copy the existing page, change, make changes to that page, and then do what's called a split URL test. And in your testing tool, you can say uh, just point, just send every other visitor to the changed URL. Uh, you can build, um, uh, you can use the WYSIWYG editor. So most of these tools come with a WYSIWYG editor where you can go in and as if you were using uh, PowerPoint or probably more, more accurately, it's, it's like using uh, PowerPoint, um, you would be able to make changes. So it's very easy to make headline changes, pretty easy to move things around. Um, all of this can be done by someone in marketing, 
who's not necessarily got the um, uh, programming chops to write JavaScript. But then, of course, if you've got something more involved, you, someone, you or someone on your team can write JavaScript to change the HTML and CSS. So some examples of uh, what we would call a simple change. Uh, this was a page where we wanted more people to buy this column. Uh, this is a product that plugs into your car. So we were able to go into the WYSIWYG editor and just edit out some of the, the choices. Our hypothesis was that we really were making it harder to choose rather than easier to choose. And fortunately, we were able to, to increase the conversion rate and have more people buying this. So something easy enough for the WYSIWYG editor. Now, you saw this test. Uh, this is quite a change. This required some input from our designer and our team had to um, go in and make some CSS uh, changes on this one. Um, but it was a nice winner with 52% left. And then some complex things. So this is an idea that I think you should put on your hypothesis list, especially those of you that are generating leads. Uh, taking a regular form, not a complex form, but turning it into a um, turning it into a, a, a quiz style thing. And we're seeing this being successful in so many industries that I would uh, absolutely put it on your list. But this is really complex. And so at the least, this one will bubble to the bottom of the list because it's going to require planning. Uh, it's going to require developer implementation. This can be implemented in an A-B testing tool, but it has to be someone who's really good with JavaScript uh, and CSS and HTML. So the third reason to kill big ideas on your list is it's just too small of an idea. It's not a big enough change. This is a contrary example. There are two ways that an idea has or a design change has impact. Number one, it's a big change. Like it's the change in the design of the page or it's an insertion of a, a component or it's moving things around on the page. The other way it can have impact is by putting it close to an important uh, element. So this is the add to cart button on this. The only change on this page was the addition of this uh, content here, but because it was close to the uh, that button, we deemed it having high enough impact. But if you're changing something lower on the page, if you're changing something in the footer, if uh, you're um, uh, changing the color of a button, those are not going to be big enough changes that you're going to be able to detect a difference in behavior with an A-B test. And then the final reason to really kill a good idea is that you don't have any data on that. So your ideas should be supported by some data. Some of your ideas are just like, I think this would be better. Well, what is that? Those are your biases speaking. So if you can back up your idea with something that you see in heat map reports, something that you've seen in customer surveys, something that you uh, have seen in any user testing that you're doing, uh, that's going to help immensely. And L's uh, is your go-to girl for um, user testing. I hope she doesn't mind me calling her a girl. She's clearly a woman. We want to avoid a brainstorm for choosing what to test. Brainstorms are great for developing the hypothesis list, but let's not every week go in and put it all up on the, on the board as, okay, what do you guys want to test next? You really need to go in and find evidence. So look in analytics. Look at your customer surveys. Look at your site feedback. Um, and I recommend asking the question on your thank you page, what almost kept you from buying today? Have you read chat, chat transcripts? You see things in there that your website is missing and generates hypotheses or supports existing hypotheses. You should regularly talk to salespeople or customer service reps. They're Biases generally only go back about seven days because of the nature of their business. Uh, visit sites like Conversion Sciences for hypothesis uh, for hypothesis that you can find evidence on. And of course, you can steal from competitors' websites. Add them to the hypothesis list so you can research them using heat map reports, session recordings, uh, online focus groups. Uh, we use Usability Hub and uh, User Zoom for user testing videos. Um, you're going to want to be able to get good at this because this allows you to very quickly test your ideas against other people um, and help you narrow down the things that you're going to take to an A-B test. So the bottom line here is, do I have a winner? Uh, do I have a winner here? There are three outcomes of an A-B test. You can have a win, 
in which your variation uh, statistically outperformed the control at 95%. You're going to have a save at which the new variant would have significantly reduced, statistically significantly reduced your conversion rates, revenue per visit, and then an inclusive to inconclusive test in which it, there's no evidence that the, the new variation is better. Uh, some examples here is an inconclusive test. You can see that, um, you know, the probability to beat is 47%. We're looking for 95%. And there's lots of overlap in this area, inconclusive. However, here's one that was close, not so much overlap, but it's an, only a 91% confidence. And this, this is... This is not a probability that it will be a winner. We need to cross the boundary above 95% before we can call it a winner. Uh, there is a, a variety of analysis called Bayesian, which will give you a percentage, uh, uh, and you can make a business decision on that, but it's a different, a little bit different calculation than this. And then here is what a winner would look like. Uh, no overlap on the, the key parts, 97% confidence and yay, we've got a winner. Uh, this is a great example of a save. So we can see that the variation would have significantly underperformed the control. Most, in tests are, most tests are inconclusive, so don't get frustrated if you're testing and testing and you're finding that um, they're all inconclusive. You maybe need higher impact uh, or the things you're testing probably should have been dropped from the list from one of the outlined. Um, but what you're going to have to do is go through this process before you test. Do you have enough conversions to test in a reasonable time? You saw how we can use the CXL tool for uh, pre-test analysis. Does the change have significant visual impact enough to, to be noticed by visitors? Is there some evidence to back up your idea? Have you found something in, in, in your surveys and heat map reports and user research to back it up? And is it an idea that you can reasonably implement? Um, uh, so my question for you is, what do you want to learn from your visitors? What will you learn about your visitors? Because it's ultimately what this is all about. There are two primary kinds of tests. One is we're going to test to increase conversion rates, or we're going to test to learn something fundamental. Headline tests will often tell you something fundamental about the messaging that you should be using for your visitors. Moving things around, changing the UX is generally more um, opportunistic um, and is trying to find ways to reduce friction so that more people get through the process. So, um, I invite you to go and start that before and after test. I am going to take the rest of the time here to answer questions. So, uh, David, um, you guys have been monitoring the chat. Yeah, Brian, that was awesome. I, I wish, I honestly wish I saw your talk before I started A-B testing years ago. It would have saved a lot of headache, a lot of heartache. <laughs> um, but you know what? I'm still, I still get to learn from you. So some questions. Um, I think a big question for folks just getting started with A-B testing is, what's a test you recommend folks start with? You know, they haven't run A-B tests. It seems... A little bit overwhelming setting up these tools and all that. I saw you use Google Optimize as an example there. What's a, a good place to start? Um, I would start with a before and after test. Go ahead and do that. And I would start collecting your ideas. So we have a spreadsheet that allows us to list our hypotheses to uh, put them in a, a category based on is it um, social proof? Is it messaging? Is it design and layout? Is it um, does it involve um, security and uh, uh, security and or, or is it related to credibility and authority, which are kind of the big areas? Um, start collecting those ideas and give yourself a few columns where you can rank them based on you know is this a hard day is this hard do I have any evidence to back it up is this really going to be a, a big enough change that people are going to notice um, and um, uh, is it going to take a, a lot of work to implement that sort of thing? So start with your list, with your ideas, do some of this before and after analysis um, on some changes in that you've had in the past. And um, that's a great way to start um, understanding the give and take, especially on this before and after you can change these uh, P 
periods all you want, begin to see what longer periods uh, look like, shorter periods look like, and how that affects the, the reports. So, uh, Google, if you're on Google on Analytics, Google Optimize is a free tool that um, will be a great one to start with. Um, so uh, if you really want to install an A-B testing tool, that would be a great place to start. Yeah, and just some folks like personal story on my end, when I was at HubSpot, they didn't want to give me access to A-B testing tools because they didn't want just some random marketer changing the website. And But I wanted to learn how to use the tools. So what I did is I created my own website and I just put Google Optimize on that so I could get familiar with the tool and I could at least tell my VP, like, I know what I'm doing. Just, mm -hmm. just give me access. Let me test on this one page to, to build trust with you before I go try to make any bigger A-B testing changes. So um, for folks who seem like, oh, I, my, my, my VP doesn't want me changing a homepage, you don't have to start with the homepage. That's a, that's a pretty high risk, uh, potentially high risk update. Yeah, and these tools are powerful. So you are, while you can bypass IT, uh, let's, not, um, let's not bypass the QA and everything. So uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think a question that comes up often is how big should these sample sizes be for before after testing or how long do you recommend those timeframes? Yeah. So uh, generally, which, what is a rule of thumb, we use a uh, 100 conversions per variation. So if you're on an e-commerce site, you're going to be testing on a page that is driving uh, at least 200 transactions um, and uh, we tend to target per month. An A-B test can can run eight weeks, um, so two months, um, um, fifty six days would be the the, the proper period of time. Um, but beyond that, um, market changes tend to, to can mess with your data, um, and it's hard to get velocity up if your tests are taking three months to come to fruition. So look at for something around 200 conversions, um, 100 per um, variation, 300 if you've got two variations, that's a minimum. And that that you may find at the end of uh, four or eight weeks that you don't have a big enough sample size even with 100. Yeah, let's say, so this question is less about the actual A-B testing and more of getting by it. So let's say someone here is listening and they're like, oh, I wanna do A-B testing, but my director or VP is like not bought in on doing that because it takes so long. Um, but it sounds like it's okay to have a two month period, like time frame look to, to look at for folks who are in a situation where, you know, they might have a VP asking like, how's the experiment going? Or like, can we get data in two days? How do you recommend they get that buy-in to like run these longer time frame experiments and kind of, I guess, communicate up that it's something that's worth doing. Well, so I would do this. There are some snooping tools available. Um, Wappalizer, Ghostery, uh, Ahrefs, where you can go and snoop on what tools are installed on your competitor's sites. Uh, there's nothing more eye-opening than to go on one of your competitor's sites and see an A-B testing tool installed there. It means that they're learning faster than you and that they're going to be, uh, they're going to have higher conversion rates, which makes their ads cheaper. Um, and they're going to start beating you. So that would be one of the first things I would do to, to, to see it. if your competitors are doing or testing, then you need to pay attention. You should also be looking for uh, tools like Crazy Egg or Hotjar, um, which are heat map tools, because um, it tells you that they're collecting user intelligence data as well. So I would start there. The next thing I would do is go ahead and do some before and after analysis. So if you can find a time where something changed a page or there was a new site launch or something, do this before and after analysis as I've outlined here um, and start presenting um, things that way. You're starting to use the language of A-B testing and um, you can begin to say, well, that's what, this is what the before and after says. Do we need to design an A-B test that's going to actually prove out that um, the new design wasn't as good as the original um, because otherwise we're going to keep making the same mistakes and, and the conversion rate is going to continue to go down and down. So, yeah, that, uh, that gets me thinking about situations where a marketing team rolls out a new website and you ask, well, how's it performing? And nobody really knows because no one's actually gone in and done the analysis yet. So 
it sounds like if someone can just go look at the data and come back to the team, that could be a way to get buy-in on doing some yeah. more robust A-B testing. And, um, and if the, if the uh, sentiment is that we just we need to do some tests and get some quick wins, uh, it's not a good time for you to launch a, a conversion optimization program anyway, because that's not what this is. It's a long term growth sort of a thing. So, yeah, this this isn't growth hacking. It's a, it takes time and investment. It's not just changing the color of a button here. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned hot jar. I know I think Els and Talia Wolf had also mentioned that tool multiple times. So. For anyone listening, if, if you can't run A-B tests, at least start collecting that data. You might be surprised how people are interacting with your website and being very confused. And you might see some some anger clicks where they're, they're not finding what they want. So exactly, uh, mm -hmm. recommend getting those things set up. All right. Let me just check if there's anything else coming up here. All right. Those are all the questions. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time to share all your wisdom and helping us get started with A-B testing. Really appreciated the time. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you very much.